This unit is going to look at some of the main characteristics of plants as living organisms. So we'll start off with photosynthesis and respiration. Photosynthesis is the key process for plants that you need to know really well for your test. Photosynthesis means making through light. And this next clip looks at the four things plants need for photosynthesis to happen. All green plants need sunlight to make their own food. The process is called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis happens in the leaves. They contain a special green pigment called chlorophyll, which traps sunlight. The leaf, in all its shapes and sizes, is actually a food factory. In photosynthesis, it takes raw materials from the environment and uses them with sunlight to produce sugar. This is the food it then uses to grow. Photosynthesis can be described by an equation. Carbon dioxide plus water, with the sun's energy, produces oxygen and sugar. At nightfall, with no sunlight, plants can't photosynthesize. But as the sun rises, the food factories are back to work again. You should have come up with four things for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide and water, the raw ingredients. Chlorophyll in the green leaves. And sunlight, which provides the energy for the process. These make glucose, a simple sugar, which is the main product of the reaction and oxygen is also produced. Photosynthesis takes place in all of the green parts of plants, but generally the leaves are the major site. The leaf is adapted well for photosynthesis. It's packed with chloroplasts which contain the green pigment chlorophyll. It is the chlorophyll which absorbs the sunlight and makes the energy available for photosynthesis. This word equation is really crucial for your test. Carbon dioxide and water, in the presence of sunlight, give glucose and oxygen. You need to know this off by heart, so keep practicing. Why not write it out until you have no problems remembering it? Just like animals, when plants respire, they use oxygen in the air and produce carbon dioxide and water. But in the light, plants photosynthesize too. So to investigate the gas exchange and respiration alone, I'll have to do the next experiment in the dark. No light means no photosynthesis. This cylinder passes pure oxygen down this tubing into a bell gel. There's no carbon dioxide in there at all. Another tube passes the outlet gas through this bicarbonate indicator. Left overnight, if the plant is producing carbon dioxide, the indicator will turn yellow. So, sure enough, just like us, this plant is producing carbon dioxide. Plants not only respire at night, but during the day as well. But why do plants need to respire? Plants need to respire to release energy from the food they have made and stored. And they need energy to grow, to take up minerals, reproduce, move and make specialised cells. This is a really important point to get to grips with. As well as photosynthesizing, plants need to respire to release energy. So plants, just like animals, break down their stored glucose by using oxygen to release energy, and they produce carbon dioxide and water as byproducts. So, as we know from that crucial word equation, photosynthesis produces glucose, a type of sugar. But plants need more than sugar to survive. A sunflower might produce this much sugar in perfect conditions on an 18-hour sunny day. And a banana tree with its lovely big leaves might produce this much. This 
this youngster, with a hundred thousand leaves, can produce a massive 30 kilograms of sugar in a day. Besides the glucose that plants make from photosynthesis, plants also need other nutrients in the form of mineral salts for healthy growth. They absorb these essential nutrients using their roots, and we're about to look at those in more detail. But plants need something else, as well as light, in order to make food for themselves. They need water and the nutrients that are dissolved in it. And that, of course, they suck up from the ground. The roots with which they do so probe downwards, seeking moisture. To get that, they have to position themselves with just as much accuracy as the leaves do when finding light. Having found water, they put out thin rootlets, and from them, a fur of tiny hairs, so multiplying many thousands of times the surface area through which water can be sucked in. A diagram of a root hair cell will look like this. It is adapted to have a large surface area for the absorption of water and mineral salts. But remember, it is like a plant cell that you're familiar with, with a nucleus, vacuole, cellulose cell wall, and a cell membrane. Remember to take time to label your diagrams. So, in these last two sections, you need to know for your test that nutrients are required for plant growth and that plants have specialised cells called root hairs, which very efficiently absorb water and mineral salts from the soil. Plants and their flowers can be confusing and one of the most common mistakes is mixing up the male and female structures. So we're going to go through the parts of the flower and how plants reproduce step by step. Let's start with the structure of the flower. Now this is the male part or stamen and it produces the male sex cell, pollen. And the pollen is made in here in the anther on the top of this filament. And this is the female part, or carpal. And it produces the female sex cell, or egg, in the ovary. Can you draw and label the structure of a flower? As this is the kind of test question you're likely to get. So the sketch of your flower would look something like this the petals which can be brightly coloured and the sepals which protect the bud. The other main structures you should have drawn are the male part or stamen and that is made up of the anther and the filament. The female part is called the carpel and is made up of the stigma, style and ovary and in the ovary is the ovule which contains the egg. So how does the male part of the flower fertilise the female part? Now, in flowering plants, sexual reproduction takes place in two stages. The male pollen has to reach the female stigma. And this first part of the process is called pollination. Now, plants can pollinate themselves, and this is called self-pollination, but most of the time they don't. Mostly, the pollen travels from one plant to another and pollinates that, and this is called cross-pollination. How does the pollen get from one flower to another? There are two main ways that pollen travels from flower to flower, either by the wind or by insects. Wind-pollinated flowers have dull, tiny petals and no scent. The anthers hang outside the flower, shedding pollen that's dispersed by the wind and is picked up by the feathery, sticky stigma. Insect-pollinated flowers are scented and have brightly coloured petals to attract animals, and the sex organs are inside the flower. Write down two differences between wind and insect pollinated flowers. 
If you're not sure of the answer, why not rewind the last clip and make a note of all the differences between wind and insect pollinated flowers? Or if you think you know, stop the tape and answer the question by making your list. Your answer could start with wind pollinated flowers having dull green petals and no scent whereas insect pollinated flowers have brightly colored petals and scented flowers. And your second difference, wind pollinated flowers have their anther and stigma outside the flower, but in insect pollinated flowers, the anthers and stigma are inside the flower. So that's pollination, but what happens after that? Flower is pollinated and the pollen lands here, but it still isn't fertilization. The nucleus in the pollen still has to reach the nucleus in the egg, down here. Now, the pollen grows a long tube, like a long straw, which funnels the nucleus to the egg. Seen under a microscope, these pollen grains are germinating. Pollen tubes are growing from the pollen grains. The nucleus from the pollen, the male gamete, passes down the tube on its way to the female gamete, where they will fuse and fertilization will be complete. The flower contains the structures for sexual reproduction in plants. Sexual reproduction is the joining together of male and female gametes to produce offspring. A gamete is the reproductive cell with half the plant's genetic information. Let's summarize reproduction in flowering plants. We have pollination. Pollen from the anther lands on the stigma of another flower. Then fertilization of the female ovule and it's the ovule that becomes a seed. Seeds come in all shapes and sizes. They're miniature life support systems packed with nutrients to help the growth of the seedling in its early days. But the seed is not the end of the story. For successful reproduction, the plant has another trick up its sleeve. After seed formation, the seeds are then dispersed, either by the wind, sycamore seeds act like helicopter propellers, and the feathery parachute of the dandelion seeds means these seeds are taken further away from the parent plant. Or seeds can be dispersed by animals. The hooks on cleavers attach to animals, and hazelnuts are stored away by squirrels. <laughs> I really like plants, but lots of people don't. They don't seem to realise that they are actually things that keep our planet alive, with the gas exchange from carbon dioxide into oxygen, which takes place in their leaves. Plants carry out the very important process of photosynthesis, and they carry out respiration too. They need energy from respiration for growth and for reproduction. That's it for plants as organisms. Don't forget, you can play back any sections you're not sure of. And you could check out the Key Stage 3 bite-sized book and website for more information and practice questions. <laughs>